I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Going to start this What's the Difference with a bold statement. John Carpenter's They Live taught us everything we need to know. Oh, I absolutely agree. How to look cool in sunglasses? That's in there, yeah. How to multitask your bubblegum chewing and ass kicking? Oh, yeah. And how to be vigilant in seeing through the commercial propaganda the powers that be would use to keep you mollified and in your place? Oh, that's in there. I don't like this one. Bit. For 30 years now, They Live has been an essential viewing middle finger to Reagan-era greed and capitalism gone unchecked. Based on Ray Nelson's very short story, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's time for a refresher on the importance of seeing the real intent behind the messaging we're bombarded with every day. With no restraint on spoilers, let's get ready to ask, what's the difference? First published as a short story in the November 1963 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, 8 o'clock in the morning weighs in at an economical 1800 words and change. It follows George Nada as he wakes up to discover grotesque reptilian and yellow-eyed aliens are controlling all of humanity. Later, in 1986, it would be adapted by artist Bill Ray into an equally short seven-page comic titled simply Nada. The comic, which appeared in the Eclipse Comics anthology series Alien Encounters, was a fairly straightforward adaptation. But how did John Carpenter change 1800 words from 1963, which became seven pages worth of comics in 1986, into some of the most satirical 80s badassery there was in 1988? It starts with how we meet the main character. The story and comic, as short as they are, don't spend a lot of time developing George Nada. In both, he's just a guy who's suddenly awake. The short story starts at the end of a hypnotist show as they ask the subjects on stage to wake up, and one of them, George Nada, wakes all the way up. Nada is immediately met with a sea of faces in the theater, some of which are weird and terrifying aliens who, until that very second, had George Nada under their spell. The comic skips the hypnotist and goes straight to George already awake, where, like the short story, he walks home seeing signs that now plainly show the subliminal messaging. Work eight hours, play eight hours, sleep eight hours, and obey, and marry, and reproduce. That I'm gonna work six hours. Instead of the title on a poster turning into a subliminal message and a main character who can already see through the hypnosis, the title of the film becomes buried in a wall of graffiti with a protagonist who doesn't yet know what he's walking into. Movie Nada gets just as little backstory to start with. He's a drifter, carrying everything he owns on his back, and we meet him arriving in town just looking for some work. Short story Nada finds himself at home listening to the TV broadcast through the walls of his small apartment and hearing the alien voices for the first time when he gets a phone call from his controller, Police Chief Robinson, who says, Your heart will stop at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's such a specific threat. Specific indeed, Clint. Like, why isn't it you're gonna die at 8 o'clock? Your, your heart is going to stop? I know, right? So now, having seen behind the conspiracy's curtain and given an extremely precise expiration date, George Nada has only a few hours to wake up as many people as he can. Nada doesn't get his peek behind the curtain until about 30 minutes into the movie. Up to that point, John Carpenter takes great pains to establish a society of haves and have-nots, where the homeless are entranced by commercials and employers are kinda dicks. Hey, there's no sleeping on this site, so you park your ass someplace else tonight. Yeah, that dude's the worst. Maybe, but you know who's not the worst? Keith David. Nada meets Frank on a work site and after a small bit of creepy stalking makes his way to a soup kitchen, a utopian safe harbor where people aren't assholes to each other. Nada even gets a chance to get all warm and fuzzy about the American dream. I deliver a hard day's work for the money, I just want the chance, it'll come. However, it's not long before Nada stumbles onto a pirate signal breaking into the airwaves, trying to disrupt the alien's transmission, which, like the short story, is keeping the masses in a trance-like state of obedience. But once Nada begins to see this, the jackbooted thugs aren't far behind. It's here that Nada's faith in the fairness of the system is first tested. So setting up Nada as an outsider from the very beginning, albeit a well-intentioned outsider with a decently positive outlook, then putting that positivity through the ringer, Nada is primed to see the truth by the time he puts the sunglasses on. But back in the short story version, Nada is on the move and runs into an alien disguised as a lovable old drunk. But he starts to feel his grip on reality slip and the alien's head phases back into that of the old drunk. Aww, I love this guy! So just to keep himself squared away, Nada smashes the alien's head in with a brick. Aww. 
I loved that guy. But this is a very important distinction between the short story, comic, and movie. There's a chance that short story Nada is dreaming this whole thing, or at least is still under the influence of hypnosis. John Carpenter leaves no doubt that what Nada is going through is for sure and truly real. It figures it would be something like this. After seeing life through his new kick-ass sunglasses, Nada unfurls some kick-ass one-liners and launches a don't give a f style campaign of general havoc causing in what is truly one of the most iconically bonkers sequences of all time. Mama don't like tattletales. He winds up kidnapping and laying low with Holly Thompson, a TV exec who gives him a primetime slot right through the window. In the short story, Nada sets out first to wake up his girlfriend in a really shit way, and when that doesn't work, he's confronted by her neighbors. He kills a few more aliens without giving it a second thought, and again, hinting that Nada might be hallucinating all of this, his girlfriend doesn't see the dead bodies as aliens, instead still seeing her harmless old neighbors. Movie Nada meanwhile tries to find an ally in Frank, the ensuing nearly six minute brawl where a grown man insists another grown man put on a pair of sunglasses is, frankly, the best. No! It's a brutal fist fight in an alleyway that feels like the kicks to the groin featured about halfway through it. After finally getting Frank to wear the glasses, the two allies stumble onto a resistance movement and even cross paths with Holly the TV exec again. But like all the best canceled TV shows, their reunion is short lived. The Resistance hideout is stormed once again by the alien-controlled police force and wiped out. In the escape, however, Nada and Frank use an alien teleportation device to get away, winding up in the alien's base of operations. A dinner party for the rich and powerful just down the hall from the TV studio broadcasting their sinister signal. In the short story, and keep in mind we're up to page 5 of 7 here, Nada starts to drink his woes away when he gets the idea to go after the TV signal. He barges into the studio with guns he found at his girlfriend's neighbor's place. In the short story, it's an alien poison dart gun, but in the comics, it's just a regular human-made death machine. Nada takes out the crew and anchor of the evening news, then to wake everybody up, simply props the dead body up in an anchor chair and does an alien voice into a microphone off camera, asking the city to wake up and kill the aliens. And it totally works. But here's the rub. Nada isn't around to see the aliens overthrown, because at 8 o'clock the next morning, as promised, his heart stops. Movie Nada and Frank force their way into the studio and take out the below-the-line crew of the alien news before moving through the rest of the building and up to the roof to destroy the source of the signal. But the real enemy of John Carpenter's version of the story shows up one last time. Man's own greed. I like what you did with that, uh, that there filter. Thanks. Holly Thompson makes one last plea for Nada to see things her way and just let the alien overlords run the show because you can't win against the forces of the rich and powerful who control what you think, feel, and desire. But Nada, in the end, still has hope for the world and, with a middle finger in his dying breath, blows up the antenna and sets humanity free. Like the short story, movie Nada isn't around to see the fruits of his labor, but the film ends the same way. Around the city, people are finally seeing the aliens for what they are, fragile, grotesque creatures hiding behind a bought and paid for mask of privilege. And so John Carpenter took 1800 words worth of an interesting 1960s sci-fi premise, waking up to realize that aliens have lulled you into a trance, and expanded it by throwing a not too subtle jab at the ruling class of the 80s. What started as a man waking up to the world around him, even if only in his head, became a man an all-time great wrestling man, mind you, but a man able to finally see behind the lies he'd been fed his entire life. And that's why it's become such a cult classic. For over 30 years, the film keeps getting more and more relevant with every greedy cheat that profits off the rigged system. Also, that fight scene just never gets old. Oh, for sure. But eh, mostly the greedy cheats profiting off the old rigged system thing, you know. I'm pretty sick of it, Glenn. <laughs> Me too, buddy. I'm sick of this whole thing. <laughs> For What's the Difference and Casey Redman, I'm Clint Gage reminding you to make a difference and get out there and vote if you haven't already. And be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Man.